Welcome to an all new episode of the Future Podcast. I'm Steve Factor, and since now I'm in the habit of talking about topics we're not supposed to talk about, let's talk about discrimination. And let's talk about the relationship between discrimination and power. Now, I've worked with countless CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, all the Cs, uh, senior executives, professionals from multiple industries, uh, financial services, consumer goods, uh, technology. And I've also hired a lot of people. I've interviewed a lot of people. I've promoted a lot of people from all walks of life, all genders, all colors. And one thing that I've pretty consistently noticed is an inverse relationship between power and bigotry. In other words, the more bigoted you are, the less power you're likely to have. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions. There are always exceptions. But I don't think the society we have, and especially in the business world, and that's really what I'm going to address in this episode, I don't think you can get away with it. And I'll go a little bit deeper. First of all, there is zero doubt in my mind that there is still racism and sexism and pockets of it in all kinds of organizations. Uh, there are people who cling to all kinds of bad ideas. That I don't think ever goes away. But I think the incidence of it is decreasing. And I've heard some crazy stories, but the frequency of those crazy stories from my uh, black and female colleagues is decreasing. And the reason for that is very simple, survival. Now, we all talk about tolerance and how important tolerance is, even though a lot of people act very intolerant towards people who are different than them. But the one thing that the business environment does not tolerate for long is failure. Everyone wants to do a good job. Everyone wants to look good in front of their boss. Everyone wants to get a raise and get promoted. That is universal in any business environment. And that impulse is the single greatest anti-racism tool available to us, especially in business. No professional I know or have ever met would consciously choose a lesser candidate, someone who is not as good because their bigotry is that strong. I have yet to meet a person whose bigotry trumps their will to succeed. That would be career suicide. And there's a lot of talk, especially in these new uh, training classes about unconscious bias. Well, I've got news for you. Everyone has unconscious biases and those will never go away. However, who do you know is qualified to litigate someone else's subconscious? Who can tell what is inside of another person's head until they act on it? Someone has to act on it for you to know that whatever bad ideas they may hold, they are actually acting on. And this is part of this idea of guilt before innocence that we've somehow become okay with. And it isn't okay because something has to manifest itself in the real world for us to have evidence, to have proof. And we can't walk in with that presumption. We can't walk into any situation presuming that the other person has nefarious purposes or has some sort of, um, you know, bigoted ideas, regardless of their, you know, race or whatever other things that, you know, some people look like meatheads. I kind of look like a meathead. You might think, hey, this guy's got some bad ideas. But but you can't know those things and you can't presuppose. And those assumptions are really bad. You have to go into every conversation, treating that person as an individual, giving them the dignity to represent themselves with their ideas, with their thoughts, with their actions, not with presuppositions. And I feel like we're headed in that direction and it's not a great one. Now, there are people who are still bigoted but they are bleeding power in this society because you can't succeed in a society wired for achievement, holding all kinds of biases. 
I have no idea who runs America's Department of Narratives, but I can tell you for sure that this system that we have punishes failure and all of the actions that precipitate it. And at this point, discrimination is failure. It is. Because the people, the few people, the shrinking group of people that still practice it in society are bleeding power. They are losing power. And so all of these acts that you see, which are scattered, there's not a lot of them. Uh, I know the media likes to make a lot of it, but it's a sign of weakness, not of strength. You know, waving a gun around or having some, you know, <laughs> wearing a hood, uh, which totally is not fashionable. But, um, you know, white after Labor Day, who, who would do that? Uh, realistically, there is no way that those are signs of strength. They're signs of weakness, of desperation. No one's looking at that and <laughs> looking at all these goobers and going, hey, I better sign up. These guys have all the best ideas. It's just not happening. They're losing power in society and they know it. Their ideas are bad. That's why people aren't flocking to them. Yeah, there's some trolls on forums and occasionally they come to life in, in some rally, but they're disappearing because discrimination is failure. A society that's wired for achievement punishes bad decisions, punishes failing decisions, punishes failing ideas, and these guys are failing. And this is why I think recalibrating the world around anything else but achievement is the worst possible idea because that actually guarantees systemic discrimination. And what it does is it takes away the one power any person can seize, and that is excellence. Because you can have the biggest bigot on earth, and that person will have to take your call if you can make them money, if you can offer them something of value. And I remember, this is the stupidest example, but I remember I, I would listen to the Howard Stern show as a kid. And uh, this is, by the way, a very different time. Uh, Howard used to have this goofy Klansman on. I don't, uh, I don't remember his name. But this, this guy would call in. He had such a, he was so dumb. But the guy loved Eddie Murphy. He, he loved Eddie Murphy. He would not stop talking about how much he loves Eddie Murphy movies. And it just goes to show you that, you know, how uh, tightly held are these ideas when even the, the you know, the, the, this, this guy who's uh, supposedly full of hate can't stop watching Eddie's movies. So, you know, and, and there are much more sophisticated examples of this, but the reality is you can't get away with that. And if you're good enough, you're going to entertain the clan. At some point, some, some, some idiot is going to be watching going, hey, this guy's funny. And there will always be some sort of nepotism. I was on uh, uh, Twitter a couple of days ago and I saw a post by uh, Leon Panetta's daughter. Now, Leon Panetta is a guy and I think he was in the Clinton administration. He's like a bigwig uh, uh, political guy. And I had no idea his daughter was anything in politics or media or whatever she is. She had a blue check mark and a bunch of followers. And I'm like, look, maybe she's super talented. I have no idea. But the point is, you know, some doors get opened when you have those kinds of connections. And that's never going away. That's not going away for Will Smith's kid either, who got to be Karate Kid or, you know, any other famous person's uh, uh, offspring. People get doors open. But... When that door opens, it doesn't stay open forever. I've seen this in comedy clubs where you have a comedian come in who is super famous, had a super successful TV show, and the audience is thrilled. They're like, oh my God, this is amazing. They give them a standing ovation. And then that's it. They have to prove themselves. And what if they're there to work on new material? Guess what? They're going to have a lot of very quiet, uncomfortable moments with that audience because they gave them the, you know, the benefit of the, uh, benefit of the doubt. They had all these great notions of what they're going to be and then they weren't and then they go away and that spot opens up for the next person. And so you can only go so far on nepotism. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of people who are good enough where they can cling to those positions if they have a good work ethic, but we can all take those seats if we 
embrace excellence. And the force necessary to eliminate nepotism and favoritism might be greater than the problem they present. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I've seen societies that have tried to impose uh, equality and regulate every single relationship. It's, I don't think it's possible. And I think that the cream will rise to the top, especially in hard fields, especially in things where empiricism rules. If you're going to be a doctor or a scientist or any kind of professional aviation, you know, things that require excellence, planes not going down, <laughs> that is a good sign that you are excellent. And no matter who signs uh, off on, on your recommendation, if uh, the plane goes down, uh, you're not going to be uh, there in that job for long. And I don't want to imply that corporations are perfect meritocracies. They are not. I've seen some things that would make your blood boil. I've personally experienced them. In other words, um, let's, let's call it this way, uh, promotions and opportunities for reasons other than performance, or at least a certain kind of performance. And it's never going to be fair. But over the long term, effort and excellence will win. And there's something in the amorality of corporations that keeps us moving towards a more equitable society. Now, I have been extremely critical of corporate amorality. You can look it up on Twitter and all kinds of other posts that I've made. Uh, corporations are, I, I don't think they're immoral. I don't think they're moral. I think they're vessels for profit. And that means that they will do whatever maximizes profit. Now, sometimes it looks moral, but also there's uh, probably a long-term angle. There's a long game that they need to play in terms of uh, pleasing consumers and where society is going. And that amorality is actually a moderating lever in this case, in the case of uh, bias and discrimination, because they, if they're geared for profit and success, can't afford to carry a bunch of losers who don't like people for their gender or their race or any other superficial characteristic. And to me, the best business case for diversity has always been augmentation. We all have a lens on the world and a certain set of experiences, but that lens is limited. We, we only can have one life and that life, uh, you know, it maybe is in a certain area or at a certain level of uh, wealth or whatever it is. And that means that we're precluded from having certain experiences. And by bringing in people from all walks of life, it helps you have a more comprehensive lens on the world. It fills in the gaps in that spectrum. And that is a good thing because it makes you better at selling. It makes you better at understanding your customers. It makes you un un uh, find gaps in the marketplace you wouldn't have seen otherwise because you're, you're blind to them because maybe it's your blind side. That's the part of the spectrum you can't see. And there's been an effort to treat corporations as vessels for values and for justice and specifically racial justice. Um, I think a lot of the problems in our society uh, and in inequality that's happened, happened upstream. They happened before people got to the corporate or the job level. And to expect corporations to right those wrongs, you know, maybe on the margins they can, but again, amoral entities have an obligation not to fix society, although I think they can contribute. But I think the perpetual reinforcement of excellence is the line that they need to hold. And I think we need to do a better job upstream of providing the most excellent candidates and people who have had the opportunities to learn and to excel. So I, I don't personally, and you know, people will disagree with me, I'm sure this, that's fine, but um, I don't see corporations as social justice organizations, except in rooting out 
situations where it does occur and it does occur. So when it does, I think it's every corporation's job to root it out and extract it from their culture because it is corrosive. It will destroy people. And everyone in the organization has to know that their peers, when they look around that conference room, are there because they are the best that was available to that company. That the, that person's the best. They cannot have any questions. Oh, is this person here because they got some uh, unfair opportunity, whether it's nepotism or whether it's you know some sort of justice um, cause? Because either way, that person will not be positioned to succeed. It has to be excellent. And in the short term, if it isn't, in the long term, it has has to be. And there's also a big difference in how we define diversity. Now, uh, the government and politicians define diversity as a, a certain set of historically underprivileged groups uh, and nationalities and races. Um, in corporate, I think what's more important is cultural and socioeconomic differences, differences of opinion and points of view. And I think you end up mostly in the same place. But if you try to litigate it, it's also very easy to end up with a room that looks like a rainbow and still thinks exactly the same because they've had the same exact experiences. So I think we need to bring those two definitions into alignment. And I feel like where we're going is not the better place. I, I really don't. I don't think um, using immutable characteristics is the best way to achieve diversity. I think if we went for socio socioeconomic, cultural, and diversity of opinion, we'd probably end up in the same place. And it's the same thing I have about um, inequality. Uh, you know, people talked about COVID, for example, and they talked about how um, it affects communities of color more. Yeah, because it's indexed to socioeconomic conditions. So if you have a group that's more likely to be poor, then of course, they're going to be more affected. But the problem is that they're poor and they live in, in close quarters or a lot of people live in, you know, the same apartment or the same house. So, you know, we should be trying to help people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged because you're actually targeting the right group and you're doing it in a less divisive way. And look, People can disagree with me. I think there's, you know, uh, good arguments for reparations and other things. But if we continue to go down this route and we continue to have these conversations in a poorly targeted way, we're going to be solving the wrong problems and we're also going to be creating divisions in the country. And call me crazy. Uh, I, I feel like this is I'm making a political speech, but I think we will help 99.9% percent of the same people by making these arguments about economic justice and not just uh, based on people's immutable characteristics. That's it for my soapbox. I'm Steve Factor. Join me on the McFuture and more bonus episodes on patreon.com. So if you enjoyed this, share this with a friend, tell others and subscribe. See you next week on the McFuture.